Welcome back to the Deliver That platform, folks. I'm your host, Ben Alkire. Thank you so much for consuming the content morning, afternoon, and evening. We appreciate it. As always, if you could, hit that subscribe button down below. That's going to help us out more than you could ever know. I have another amazing Delivering More episode to bring you folks today. I have with me an investor, a strategic advisor, a restaurateur, and a founder and CEO, most notably of the ice cream brand 16 Handles, and most recently, the CEO of Jabba Brands. Let's learn a little bit more about Solomon Choi. Awesome. Where, uh, where are you out of today? Where are you located? So my home office is on Long Island um, in New York. After spending 14 years uh, living in Manhattan and in the city, moved the family out here uh, just just prior to the uh, to the exit, and so uh, living the suburban life, living the dream. Perfect. That that actually that is a great segue. I want I want to start off with a little this or that segment for you. Um, I'll give you one two options. You pick one or the other. Um, maybe a little detail on why you picked that selection. We'll we'll go from there. But we'll start out. Um, this is a good one. So we'll do Solomon this or that city or suburbs. Suburbs. And if you were to ask me. Pre kids, city all day, especially as a single entrepreneur, um, and even when I got married, you know, as as a young couple. Uh, but certainly with the kids now, and you know, in school, the suburbs all day. Awesome, yeah, yeah. I'm I've I've been a suburb guy my entire life, but I do like the city life. I've I've only been to New York one time specifically. I think I was 14 or 15, like eighth grade maybe I, I loved it though. i like the hustle and bustle of things you feel the energy it feels nice yeah i mean the energy is great um and again i, I think especially as an entrepreneur as a founder to be able to have a lot of like-minded individuals also kind of a grinding hustling wanting to network and then a, especially a city like new york uh you know which you know is open late has access it's a it, it's a great place to be a lot of energy a lot of ambition um great companies that are built uh and, and have offices there as well um, but, you know, now at, in this stage of my life now, uh, you know, less about that energy and more about me being able to have the energy for my kids. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the suburb kind of rounds that out nicely. Yeah, I got, got a tra- little transference of energy there. Um, we, we are recording a little early here on a Friday. It's, it's around 1030 our time. So we'll go to the next one. Hot coffee or iced coffee? Iced coffee. Uh, so I only started drinking coffee uh, when my daughter was born, when my daughter Jubilee was born. Um, and specifically cold brew. So I don't even drink iced coffee. I only drink cold brew um, exclusively and call me cheap, but it got to a point where I was like, I, I'm, I'm not okay spending, you know, six, $7 uh, for, for cold brew when I can make it myself for less than a buck. So shout out to Stone Street Coffee. I, I steep my own cold brew. I drink it. Obviously, if I'm out and about and I don't have access to it, I'll, I'll buy it then and bite the bullet. Uh, but cold brew all day. That's it. Nothing else. Oh yeah! Shout out Stone Street. Shout, shout out Stone Street. What about the, a, a little road trip action? Would you rather be the driver or the passenger? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm usually by default the the driver, um, especially for the family. My wife doesn't like driving. Um, I don't particularly like long distance driving, but uh, you know, if it comes down to it, I, I'd still rather be the driver. I, I like being in control and being kind of the. Uh, you know, the, the, the point person to get us to the destination. And so I'll, I'll choose driver. Okay. 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 How about the, you, you look great as well here. So we'll go next to this one. How about, would you rather dress up or dress down? I like dressing up. Um, I'm a firm believer in kind of like representing yourself, at, you know, with your best ability. Um, when I'm dressed up like I am now, I feel like I put my best foot forward. I feel like things are more serious. And so I take things more seriously. That being said, uh, I do like to dress and I'm a runner um, and I'm, I'm also a, a Peloton rider, which I did this morning. And so, you know, dressing down certainly has its perks as well. But generally speaking in business and networking, I mean, dress dress up and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, outshining the competition is something that I do at the retail level. It's what I do at the brand level. And so to me, again, putting your best foot forward. Um, in general, I think it has been, has been working for me. So I'll continue doing that. All right. All right. I, I'll, I'll take that. I agree with that. What about uh, in communication terms, texting or calling? Ooh, that's a good one. I'm old school. I like calling. Uh, I also know, though, you know, throughout my career and journey with 16 Handles, I was typically the oldest guy in the room. I did that by design. Um, and I know that with my team, they didn't really appreciate that, especially like the younger, you know, millennial and then Gen Z uh, interns that we would get, they prefer texting. Um, and so to me, I'm all about 
use the communication method that's preferred by your constituents, by the people you're trying to communicate to. So I got better at, at, at texting, but my personal preference is I, I like calls. Um, the only thing I don't like is if it's a call that's not expected. And so I have a robo spam blocker on my phone. So that way it kind of weaves through all, all calls. But generally speaking, if you know me, call me. Um, if I don't pick up, there's a reason why, but I'll call you back. And so I like calling. I think it's more intimate. I think you get a lot of things that are uh, maybe pulled out of context with text. Uh, which you can tell by certain, you know, inflection point emotions that carry through better uh, in, uh, you know, in, in voice. You know, I, I don't think I've mastered emojis quite well, and so again, I, I need the I need the voice to to truly understand how you feel. That that was exactly going to be my standout. Was I was going to ask what you? How do you think? Would you grade your emoji game A B C D F? What do you think your emoji game is? I'll give myself a solid C. <laughs> I give myself a solid C. All right. All right. Um, and last one, we'll close it out with this one. I like asking people in the restaurant industry this, f- see which way it goes. Um, would you rather um, go out to eat or stay in at home and cook? I prefer to go out and eat. Um, I, so my uh, my routine with, uh, with the kids, I, I have two young kids, six and four. My wife works at NYU Hospital, so she's gone every morning. Um, and it's been this way for the last seven years since my kids were born. Um, so I'm on dad duty solo every morning, getting them ready, making them breakfast, cleaning that up, getting them to school. Uh, so to me, knowing how difficult that is, even though it's a part of my routine, I really enjoy when we're able to go out and, and kind of be served in that regard and also having the options, right? So with, with my kids, I don't give them breakfast options. On the weekends when mom's home, they love it because they'll ask them, you want pancakes, you want scones. When dad's making breakfast, it's, this is it. <laughs> there, there are no options. And so, you know, going to a restaurant is great because the kids get options, I get options. And again, like we don't have to worry about the dishes and kind of like recognize that service and enjoy it. So eating out. Okay. Okay. Easy enough. I, I appreciate you you indulging my first segment there, this or that. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I do obviously, this is our first time communicating in general other than a little LinkedIn DM, so some email um, is back and forth. So I, so I want to get to know a, a little bit more about your background outside of the restaurant industry, kind of growing up and things like that. So um, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, family life, growing up, mom, dad, brothers and sisters, uh, what Where's your family originate from? Things like that. Yeah, so I was born in Seoul, South Korea. Um, Immigrated with my parents when I was a toddler at 18 months. Uh, We lived uh, lived in in, in the East. Like we lived in Silver Springs, Maryland, actually, when we first immigrated. Um, And then when my sister, who is five years younger, when she was about to be born, we had actually moved to Los Angeles. And so I grew up uh, in the West Coast uh, as a child. My fondest memories were there. Um, I have two younger sisters. So I have a sister five years younger than me and another sister 10 years younger than me. And so the pretty, pretty wide range there. Uh, my parents told me, don't do that <laughs> unless, unless you have a lot of energy. Um, but yeah, my parents, uh, you know, we, we moved to Los Angeles and stayed in Southern California. Um, I, I, I went to school there, I went to USC for undergrad. I mean, I really stayed there and was able to, uh, you know, throughout my career, open up restaurants all throughout Southern California from LA down to, down, down to San Diego. Uh, but then in 2008, had the opportunity to start my own brand and went all the way out east to, to New York City, which, by the way, was actually a homecoming to a certain degree, because when we flew in from from South Korea, it was actually into JFK to then get to Maryland. And so I guess, you know, New York City was where I first landed like in, in America uh, back in 1981. And uh, yeah, so that so here we are now. And, you know, now I've got my family here. We live in New York. And uh, so I kind of have that bi-coastal relationship because you know, every Christmas break, we still go back to the West Coast, A, to take a respite for a week during winter break to, to enjoy the Southern California weather. And then secondly, to obviously like reconnect with friends and family who are still there. But uh, that was uh, that was the upbringing in a nutshell and kind of how I ended up from South Korea to New York, Maryland, California, back to New York. Yeah, that, that's all. That's all crazy and, and, and very intriguing. What um. Seoul, Seoul, South Korea. How often do you go back to visit? Are, are you back overseas ever there often? Or how often would you go back to see any family that's still there? You know, pre-pandemic, uh, I had been going probably for five years straight annually. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I'm part of a, a group of um, entrepreneurs that the Korean government actually sponsors where of Korean descent, but now operating a business around, you know, around the globe. And so kind of the diaspora that of, of South Koreans that have kind of gone and, and established lives and careers in other countries, they wanted to kind of foster this networking. And so uh, this, this, uh, this organization called YBLN, Young Business Leaders Network, 
would have an annual meeting in South Korea every year. And so that gave us kind of a, a reason to be able to meet in person. And interestingly enough, I, I believe we have uh, like 45 countries represented now um, across 250 members or so. So kind of crazy. I didn't know we had, you know, Korean CEOs in like Chile and, you know, Kyrgyzstan and, you know, these, 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 these countries that I've never even been to. And so uh, really interesting there. But yeah, I've been able to see the development of South Korea over the years and really over the decades now, because I remember when I was young, I would go and had fond memories there. But just in seeing what it is today, and I actually haven't gone back since pre-pandemic. I believe the last time I went was in 2019. Um, and so even just in that four-year gap, it's changed a lot from what I'm able to see and gather. And it's really interesting to see kind of the hyper growth of a civilization in such a small country that only several decades ago, a handful of decades ago, was regarded a third world country and is now one of the leaders in development, uh, technology and and, and, and in commerce. And so, uh, yeah, really proud of that, you know, as a, as a, as a Korean native, but then also as a visitor, it's just like amazing to be able to go there, see that, get downloaded with ideas, see concepts and excited to kind of like bring that back and, and think like, well, what can we do here? And, um, look, America's great. It's my home. Uh, but there are also a lot of things like from a development standpoint, uh, that I'm able to go to Korea and just see like, you know, ingenuity and creativity, like on a whole nother level, and yeah, it brings me joy. But again, just even as a spectator and a visitor, it's it's awesome to see. Yeah, that, that that's unbelievable. Um, I I think you know for me personally, I, I don't even have. I'm about to turn thirty in, in three months. I don't even have a, a passport. So like, be, being able to navigate that is is unbelievable stuff for me. And young business leaders, shout out the young business leaders. Um, the other question I had in, in terms of your background that as you as you were mentioning things. East Coast or West Coast? What what is your preference nowadays? I, you you stay in New York, but but if you had a default, what would it be? Fighting words now. Um, so I'll choose I'll choose East Coast. Um, and obviously, like I'm here now. Uh, you know, a lot of my fond memories as an adult and certainly as a professional were established here. So naturally, so. Um, that being said, if we're arguing for weather, I'll, I'll choose West Coast all day. Uh, you know, I think most people would. Uh, but what I what I like about the East Coast, and again, I think I appreciate it because I grew up in the West Coast, was I think there's more of this mentality of wanting to achieve greater things and being able to work harder for them. You know, and I think there's uh, not to not not to say that from my West Coast upbringing and my friends are that they don't work hard, but it certainly seems to be valued a lot more here. And you know, now as a father, like I, I like that. You know, and I think that uh, if I were to have continued staying and living here, especially in like the Northeast, I often wonder, like, what would my future have looked like? I, I appreciate that answer. And in the, the multiverse of things, that's a, a wild thing to consider. If you had stayed East Coast and went to an Ivy League school, like we, we might be considering a, a Solomon Choi run in 2024 for president at this point. Like, you, oh, I, don't, I don't know about all that, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it would be, you know, Dr. Solomon Choi or Solomon Choi MD at an investment bank, you know, again, like to me, I, I think those careers are often regarded as like, uh, you know, kind of like some of the top careers to seek after. And, you know, certainly within my, uh, you know, my, my, my ethos and, and my culture group. Right. And so when I look at a lot of like East Asians that grew up here, including even my cousin, who was my CFO, right, went that traditional banking route, investment banking, private equity, I was able to get him to join me on this entrepreneurial ride, which again, without me, I don't think he would have ever even considered, right? But what would have been a three month stint of helping me turned into, he helped me grow the company, um, 16 Handles that is, and stayed on as a CFO and partner to me for 13 years, you know, in my 14 year journey. And so uh, again, like I think that having that hybrid is actually the best. It'd be the same as this. If you were to ask me this or that EV or internal combustion engine, what I would actually say is like, can I pick plug-in hybrid? Because <laughs> I actually think that's the best in both worlds. Why? I can honestly say I have an internal combustion engine car. I have a full EV now, but I think my favorite was when I had my plug-in hybrid just prior to me going full EV. Um, but I like having that option, that optionality of kind of best of both worlds. In general, this is my frame of thought. Anyone who knows me has heard me speak, hears me say this over and over again. <laughs> this is my ism is I love and live for in addition to moments as opposed to in replacement of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're asking me this or that, which are very polarizing, you know, uh, things. And, and, and again, I think there's a time and a place. I think when you make a decision, it should be this or that, right? But I think in terms of like what you value, that could be 
kind of somewhere in between. Yeah, there, there's usually a little bit more gray value than, than black and white. But in addition to, instead of in replacement of, that was I, I love that quote. I love that quote. That'll certainly get clipped out at some point in time here moving moving forward. Um, we, we mentioned, you know, the possibility of you being Ivy League, things of that nature. If you had stayed East Coast, um, you grew up West Coast and chose to go to the University of Southern California, the Marshall School of Business, received the the BS in biz, Business Administration. Um, you're just a couple years off the uh, resurgence of the football program, um, Matt Liner, Reggie Bush, and things. You were just a couple years prior to that. But, I, I mean, what, what was that schooling like? I mean, I stayed in Ohio for for – it's further education. So Ohio University, you, you have the the winter season, everything like that. But I imagine at USC, you know, there's like you got pool parties throughout the entire year. You got fraternity life, things of that nature. What is the college life at the University of Southern Cal like? You know, from my perspective, and again, I'm one data point. I'm one student during one four year period of that time. But uh, what I can say is it was definitely a fun experience. And, you know, when I say that, it was a lot of that. I, I was in a I was in a co-ed business fraternity. But we had a house on Frat Row, you know, in, in the Greek village, so to speak. And so um, I got to experience something similar to the Greek life while also having kind of the professional endeavors that come with being in, in a business fraternity. Uh, you know, so we would have tailgating, you know, we'd go to the games, you know, we'd go to the Coliseum and being able to walk there after having a, a, a tailgate. Um, you know, growing up uh, in, in northern Los Angeles, my stomping grounds were Koreatown, Los Angeles. And Koreatown is the largest Korean population outside of South Korea. And so you talk about all the dining, the karaoke back then, the PC, the PC gaming, uh, you know, uh, halls that they had there. I was able to continue that because Koreatown was, you know, like an eight minute drive from the USC campus. And so to me, I had the playground, right? Not to mention all the fun things you had Hollywood. You, had, I mean, we'd go into Westwood, into enemy territory where, you know, UCLA is, but again, like, with LA, I think the accessibility of everything is a all year round, right? We don't have the seasonality uh, that would, you know, sometimes, you know, curtail some of those activities or events. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just all around a, a great, fun, mostly positive experience. Uh, you know, I think for my kids, if they wanted to choose, I'd probably have them maybe go to an East, East Coast school, uh, just because uh, again, I'd like to maybe put more of the education in there. But that was my choice to. Uh, kind of opt in into more of the fun and to opt out of more of the, of the more of the uh, you know the, the studying there, uh, but it, it was it was a great experience. I still have some very close friends that I went to school with, and we're now you know in the East Coast, and so to be able to reconnect here is great. Uh, I, I will say this: the other thing about the USC experience was the level of adversity we had to get while feeling like we had a little bit of elitism in us, and so I, I did like that, right? So we were the underdog. I mean, you have. In California, the the, uni, the UC system all around us throughout California, northern and southern California, and USC is the boo school, right? Whether it be in sports or whatever, it's like we're always the underdogs, always against this. And so I felt that as a Trojan, when you meet another Trojan, there's this immediate bond of, hey, everyone else hates us, right? First of all, think about even sports. The SEC hates us. The Big Ten hates us, although we're not joining. You know, it's like because we're actually pretty decent in football, everybody else hates us. Whereas, you know, <laughs> so I, I liked having that actually. I liked kind of being in that sense, almost the heel that had to prove their worth, that had to prove they belonged and had a seat at the table. And I think, you know, being a private school also, you know, you kind of create that camaraderie as well. Um, so yeah, so to all my Trojans out there, especially those that are maybe thinking of moving to New York or whatnot, hit me up, man. Like we, 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 we keep it real. We keep it tight, you know, and, uh, and we help each other out. And I, and I like that. Yeah, it's always unbelievable when you are like out at a restaurant or just a public function. You somehow stumble into someone and 10 minutes down the line in the conversation, you're like, wait, you went to USC or like for for me, it's always wait, you went to OU, you're a Bobcat. It's like there's such, such small, unique worlds and it all comes down, boils down to that. It's an unbelievable experience. Um, we graduate from USC. Um, you spend a little time, I believe, right after at Enterprise Rent-A-Car um, and then you jump right in to the restaurant industry. Um, my, my first question in regard to that, I think in general, is just what was your first job in the restaurant industry with, uh, I, I'm going to butcher the name, I think, but Todai Seafood Buffet, or was it uh, early on, earlier on in your life? Yeah, no, great question. And you almost got it right. It's Todai. 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 Um, a lot of people would say today. So at least yeah, I, I knew it wasn't today, so I didn't go with that. I, I tried. For me, when I worked at Enterprise, 
I will say this, the wisdom that I gained in working at that fantastic company and their management training program was two things that stuck out. One was you talk about a commoditized business, right? We hear about commodity. Oh, well, that tech's just a commodity. Anyone can do that. Or, you know, this product is a commodity. It doesn't get more commoditized than rental cars. It's literally the same exact Toyota Camry, whether it's Avis, Hertz, Budget, Payless, Enterprise. It's the same exact vehicle. There is no competitive um, you know, advantage or differentiator with the product itself. Where enterprise leads by spades is in service right? They constantly win JD Power and Associates, number one in, in customer service for the rental car category. And that's a category that, you know, is not waning anytime soon, you know, aside from maybe the pandemic, like enterprise is the largest rental car company, period. It was not when I was working there, you know, back in 2002. And I saw that the vision of the founders, the fact that it's also privately owned, right? So again, coming from private school, privately owned, you know, I like this idea of you can kind of mold and shape the culture and what this brand stands for. The brand is not the cars that it's renting. Anyone can do that, right? The brand is really this ethos of taking care of your guests, taking care of your people, and that the growth and profits will follow. I still remember that saying, maybe it's not word for word, but I still remember that from training back in 2002 when I first started. And to see it live out day in and day out, it really taught me when you're committed to that mission and you hire people with that laser focus of that's what we stand for, that's why we do what we do, then the growth and the opportunities are there. So, you know, I got um, about, you know, two and a half, three years of experience doing that. The other thing it taught me was to be able to overcome objection and take turn a no into a yes. Why? Well, they made promotability based on, can you sell insurance to people who have insurance? <laughs> right? Uh, you know, I, I feel like those types of sales jobs or sales opportunities, you know, I think Cutco, for instance, is another great sales program, right? That I've heard good things about. Where again, you're going door to door and you're essentially trying to sell knives to people who already have knives. Like, so I think this idea of being able to overcome objection, right, and craft your skill to be able to convince something with what a unique selling proposition, right? Something we use in tech all the time, something we use in brands all the time, is again a skill set that I think every individual should, should, uh, should, should have and should possess. And so, enterprise really taught me to do those things overcome objections with no, turning a no into a yes to do it with a smile and make sure that the customer is completely satisfied. And so in doing that, I was starting to win a lot of awards within the company, getting recognized. And it was at that time that my father, who was a multi-unit franchisee of Todai. So Todai means lighthouse in, in Japanese. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, he became a franchisee in the late 90s. So actually when I was in high school. And then now in 2004, I believe, um, is when uh, he had reached out to me and, 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 and said like, hey, I need help with one of my restaurants down in San Diego. We have a lot of competition there. Um, you're good at marketing and at sales. Can you come help me? And so that's that was what transpired. In effect, he poached me, right? He poached me from enterprise where I was doing well and, uh, and asked me to come help him. And so I did that. And that's how I entered into officially the restaurant industry. But before that, even when I was at SC, I would you know, on, on weekends and kind of like random Saturdays when I needed extra cash, work as a server at one of his restaurants. And so, you know, I'd been around it, obviously, and I would work on holidays. Todai was a business and their unique selling proposition was not just the fact that they had all you can eat, you know, Japanese cuisine, seafood, all this stuff, but it was also that it was open 365 days a year and very few restaurants as a chain, especially offer that. And so on these busy holidays where families would get together, Todai being large scale format for buffet. I mean, you'd have all these families coming in that don't want to cook at home or that have, you know, people coming in from all over. And so those holidays that others, you know, would spend with their family and friends were work days for me growing up, even, even from uh, like senior year of high school, I remember that. And so uh, I'd had experience, but now I had the opportunity to work as, again, I, I, I told my father that if I'm going to come work there, then I need my title to be vice president of, of marketing and operations. And he did not want to give me that. He wanted to put me through his own management training program. He's like, you're going to start at the bottom, work your way up, do dishes, work as prep, you know, be a busboy. And I said, dad, I'm not doing that. Right. And I put my foot down. I said, I'm not doing that because I'm not here because I'm asking to be here and asking you to teach me. You asked me to come here because you need help. And you see that I have a skill set for another company. So in this case, I need to, I need to do it this way. The other thing too, is I was like, I'm 25 years old. A lot of your staff have been with you for six, seven years, and they're all older than me. 
they're not going to respect me if they see their son, your son, the boss's son coming in here and doing these other things. You know, so I, I do need that title. Like that title is more than just a title. It actually creates a rank where those your GM and all these other individuals need to be below me from that dynamics. Otherwise, you know, um, I, I don't think it's going to work. And so did that turn the business around significantly. And he had a nice exit from that restaurant and ended up selling it for a nice profit um, a year and a half later. And during that time, he said, do not go back to rental cars. You should stick with this. He, he said, you honestly provided a lot more value than the franchisor at HQ. You clearly know how to do marketing. You're great with customer service. You're great at uh, training employees to be able to increase that level of service. Um, you should stay within this industry. And so that's how I got into the restaurant business um, and ne you know, never, never look back. Amazing. I'm going to, my computer, I need to change the charger real quick. Give me one second. Yeah, no worries. For some reason, my laptop isn't free to my charger, which is going to be very problematic. Oh, it's not recognizing the charger being plugged in? Yeah. No, you're on like a, like a red bar now? Yeah. <laughs> I figure out what's going on. Well, I hate that bad news here, but not working. Yeah, four percent left on my laptop, so I don't really want to like lose you. Yeah, all. that's not going to get us very far. Yeah. Um. Do you have a time, um, Monday or Tuesday, where you could schedule like thirty, forty-five minutes and wrap things up? Um. I could probably do Monday afternoon. Yeah, like Monday afternoon, like after 2 p.m. Perfect. If, yeah, I can, you I have can an that. opening there. Okay. Yeah, like 2 to 2.30, 2 to 2.45. Yeah. Cool. All right, perfect, man. I apologize. I don't know what's going on. It just like stopped reading the port or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, okay. you know, it's technical difficulty that's out of your control. Understandable. No worries. I'm going to stop recording here real quick so we at least save what we got. We are uh, we're back from some technical difficulties on on my end. I, I appreciate Solomon lending me some more time on his end. Uh, we're gonna roll right back into it here. I, I think we closed out um, talking about Todai uh, Seafood, um, the your father's business that he had started, and you lent a hand in um, helping out franchises and, and things of that nature. Um, I, I wanted to kind of move the conversation a little bit forward and, and get kind of into the thick of your career since. And that kind of begins your own founder journey as well um, with 16 handles and what I assume is kind of a intertwined product as well and, and Greeno products. Um, from what I've seen on my end, I, I know of one other creator out there. His name's Jeff Fenster. I'm not sure if you're aware of, um, but he has a company called Everbowl. Um, and he has some concepts kind of similarly intertwined um, where he owns the manufacturing as well and, and can build out his concepts and his franchisees and his buildings and also owns the end consumer product. Um, so I guess my first question is kind of around uh, Greeno and 16 Handles and that nature. Was that the initial plan in founding those two businesses? Yeah, so I, I'm very familiar with, uh, with Everbowl and that journey and a uh, firm believer that when you can carve out a competitive advantage like that and be vertically integrated, then again, like that's what provides you um, an edge over your competition. Um, yeah. So the story there is I, I moved to New York City in 2008, um, early 2008, not exactly the best time to be going to the, going to the, going to New York City in the concrete jungle to start a frozen dessert brand and leaving Southern, sunny Southern California. Um, but, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, that was going to be the you know, the journey of, of my first kind of entrepreneurial run and building a brand from ground up. And so really armed with an investment that allowed me to open up one location. Um, I opened up in Manhattan's East Village. Um, this was funded through my, my family, my mom, dad, aunt and uncle. And so it was really like one shot, one store, uh, taking everything that I had learned in California and, you know, working at Todai, working at a startup hospitality group and working at the very first self-serve frozen yogurt shop and being apprenticed there. And so uh, came to New York City. I always wanted to build my own brand, um, studied marketing in undergrad. And so this allowed me to kind of combine everything I've learned up until that point and, uh, and, and manifest it into, into a brand. 
And so 16 Handles was birthed in July of 2008 and opened up uh, in East Village, as I mentioned. I had nine direct competitors within a three block radius. And so super competitive area, but did that intentionally. So that was by design. I really wanted to see if I had what it took to, to kind of build a best in class brand and how better to do it than to jump right into the fire. Um, some of the things that stood out to me about New York City that were very different than my, my journey in California were one, most of my customers were not driving to the location. So that in and itself was uh, kind of interesting to me and that I learned in New York City, it was really um, not just the residents there of Manhattan, which I think make up like 1.5 million people, but it was primarily the non-residents. So it's the commuters, the tourists, local and from afar that can have that city swell to like eight to 10 million people. And so knowing that most of the people are not coming to me by driving, um, you know, just being accessible there off of Second Avenue, it was interesting because I knew that my other competitors were also paying market rent, right? And New York City by no means was, you know, a, a cheap place to start this enterprise. And it was uh, within a few months into the business and I'd seen kind of the business really take off. I mean, I had lines out the door. It was great. It was a great position to be in. I quickly took that pole position. So I was the kind of leading frozen dessert shop in East Village out of 10 frozen dessert shops because I was store number 10. And, uh, and, I, and I quickly realized from a branding perspective that one of our differentiators at 16 Handles was we were using kind of eco-friendly, kind of eco-conscious uh, um, disposables. And so our cups, our lids, our spoons, you know, they were you know, made of wood, then cornstarch, and you know, our, our cups were biodegradable and compostable. And I was really giving branding for an existing company that provided this. And it was, I remember a UPS driver would bring, you know, cases of these cups that were packed in cases of 500. And he's like, hey, look, man, like, I'm glad your business is doing well. But dude, like, I'm UPS. You need to work with like a food service distributor, right? He's like, I'm a one man. I'm, I'm one guy in a brown truck, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm like slipping these like five big boxes to you like every week. He's like, dude, this is like taking up too much space in my truck. Like, please find a distributor like you're a restaurant, right? Like, I'm not a restaurant supplier. And so you know, I kind of took that to heart. But when I reached out to the company directly, I remember asking, I, I said, like, hey, can you put my logo on your cups? And I remember they laughed at me. They were like, no, like, why would we do that? They're like, that's like asking Nike, hey, can you take off the swoosh logo, put our branding on there and then like sell us those shirts They're, But I said, yeah, but don't you manufacture these cups yourself? So you're a manufacturer. And they're like, we are, but we're not a co-packer. Like, we, we don't do this. We want our brand out there. And so I thought, but play this out. If I wanted to create like a, a custom order, what would that minimum order quantity be? And they were like, you'd need like a full, full container. And I was like, well, what's a full container? They're like a full 40 foot container. So again, they were using terminology I didn't know. I didn't know anything about kind of uh, that sort of logistics and, and, and distribution. But when he gave me the case count, I was like, holy smokes, I did the math. I'm like, that's like a year and a half of supplies of cups that I couldn't commit to. And so I took it upon myself, um, you know, fortunately, after selling Todai San Diego, I had the opportunity to go to Beijing, China, to go study Mandarin and China business for six months. And, you know, I knew that China was kind of, you know, obviously up there as like the Mecca of kind of creating anything that you need and being able to get it for cheap um, in bulk. And so back in uh, back in mid, you know, 2008, I went on Alibaba.com, which, you know, we're probably all familiar with now. But back then it wasn't really like this, you know, consumer facing site that everyone knew about. And basically between my broken Mandarin and the sales reps broken English, we were able to figure out how much I would need to put as a deposit down to buy my first container load. And I think I actually bought a half container load, which, you know, on a per case basis was a little bit more expensive, but again, still drastically less expensive than anything I could source domestically and still maintain that kind of eco-friendly packaging and the material that I wanted. So I, I recruited two of my good friends from California, had them come out to visit me. I think this was around October of 08. And, uh, and told them like, hey guys, like, you know, my business is doing really well. I don't know many people here, but um, I have this other idea. Bought this URL, greenoproducts.com. Um, and I, if you guys trust me, let's fork over, you know, a third each. I, I know I needed $55,000 for this like half container load. And so I was like, you know, they want half of that wired to them. So I'm wiring it to some bank in China. I mean, it was, it was pretty risky in looking back, but at this point I'm like, that's like my... I, I need that. I need to be able to do that and to unlock this kind of like discounted bulk pricing for branded products. So that way I can franchise it. And I knew that it, once the franchising took off, then obviously economies of scale, I'd be able to buy in bulk. 
lower my cost of goods. There's more profit margin for the franchisee. I knew that it would work, but in order to get there, it was a chicken or the egg. I'm like, I got to fork this over and kind of take that risk. And at that point, I convinced my distributor to hold on to and stock like essentially like six months worth of inventory, trusting me that I was going to franchise this concept. So there was a lot of trust, um, cross-border trust, as well as like, you know, uh, with my distributor domestically. And so my friends did, we, um, you know, we, we uh, bought that first half container and kind of looking back, you can say the rest is history. And I remember a lot of my competitors would come into my stores because we were the first self-serve frozen yogurt shop in New York City. And so they'd be taking pictures. So I made sure at the bottom of those cups that I had, you know, uh, greenoproducts.com. We had a 213 number because it was my friend's uh, cell phone number in, in Los Angeles. And, and we would get orders and we would get like one, two container orders of, again, Froyo cups. And so uh, to me, it was just kind of this like... Um, Vertical integration out of necessity, not necessarily out of strategy. And so I can't take credit um, like Everwolf's founder and that like I had this elaborate plan, but um, I obviously had a plan and that I needed to find a solution for myself where if the only local producers of this type of material weren't willing to work with me, I had to, I had to find my own solution. It's, it's amazing. And build, building that integration, as you said, out of necessity is, is super mindful and, and intriguing story. I, I appreciate you sharing all of that. And I wanted to dive into 16 handles a little bit more in terms of building out that concept. Um, growing up, my, my parents owned for a very short period of time, a, a Rita's Italian ice. I don't know if you're familiar with the brand might've been a competitor at some point in time. I, I think they're still around uh, nationally or in Northeast markets, Midwest possibly, but um, it, it didn't last too long. And we're in Ohio in the Midwest and building out a concept an ice cream concept specifically in a, in a cold weather market. I find to be very intriguing um, going from Los Angeles where like ice cream's like, yeah, no brainer. It's 70, 80 and sunny all day. I, I love ice cream. And you go to New York where it's four or five months out of the year, it's 20, 30, 10, five, zero degrees snowing and people don't want to leave their houses. What Was there any intrigue in, in building a concept like that? And then you also mentioned you already knew about nine other competitors. Why was that an advantage you felt like? Yeah. So to address the first part of the question, I mean, I'm very familiar with Rita's. Yes. I mean, it is technically another frozen dessert franchise, so it would be a competitor. Um, I know that with that model, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they only open up, you know, part of the year. And so that business model is very much to be able to kind of like reap the sales and the profits from kind of those peak months and then to be able to close. Um, anyway, I, I think in looking at uh, looking at it from a market perspective, so kind of the, the glass being half full. So I, I use this analogy in that, you know, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, you're always looking at the glass as half full, right? And that's what makes you kind of an entrepreneur. You're seeing an opportunity where most people don't see it and, and, and willing to do what it takes to be able to, uh, to, to achieve that. And I think in looking at New York City specifically, there were two reasons why I wanted to move to New York to do this. One, um, I had promised kind of my mentor and who I'll call kind of the godfather in the original, the OG of self-serve frozen yogurt, Mr. Song, who I learned the business from. Um, and, and obviously that's in Southern California in Orange County, again, where the weather's great and, you know, it's a year round product. But I also knew in, in even just doing research that actually in New England, so in the Northeast, they actually sell per capita more ice cream and pints of ice cream than anywhere else in the U.S. I think in the world, I think it might be number one in the world. And so this idea that when it's cold, cold isn't relevant, you know, certainly it debunked that, um, you know, you look at like a, a Ben and Jerry's, right, which was started in Vermont, right? Same thing, like not exactly the conditions you would think of where an ice cream brand would, would thrive. But in actuality, I, again, I think because of the seasonality of specifically the Northeast, I think people will certainly, you know, gravitate in those warmer months and over, you know, kind of over index in those months. But throughout the year as well, I think there's certainly a business to be had. And I mean, we certainly proved that. And ultimately in New York City, when I saw that there were nine frozen dessert shops that were paying year round Manhattan market rent, to me, that that was really the final kind of proof in the pudding, so to speak, right? Like if they're all paying market rent in New York City, where again, like, yes, it gets cold and it's competitive and the rent's some of the highest in the country and there's nine of them, then that means like there's just that much frozen dessert sales throughout the year. And so when I looked at that, I realized my challenge was I just need to be number one out of 10, right? If I open up and I'm store number 10, if I'm number one, then enough people will start talking about and thinking that 16 Handles is the number one frozen dessert brand in New York City. That was really the hypothesis. But yeah, I mean, obviously a concept like 16 Handles would 100% work in a warm climate. 
right? I think the harder thing to do is to say, hey, something that works in a warm climate, can you make it work in New York City? And I think that was the hardest challenge. And so to me, it was less about the seasonality and, and, and anything like that about the business. It was more, can you build a best in class brand that can outshine everyone else in your category? And if you have that, you now have a blueprint for long-term success. Then you end up exiting through one of your largest franchisees. Was that ever uh, something you foresaw or was that an end goal or a reality that you ever thought would actually end up happening? You know, in what, in terms of the exit and, and thinking that I was going to sell to a franchisee, that was something that, you know, I always carried in the back of my mind, to be honest, like that would have been my desired outcome um, if I could choose. At the time in 2022, I wasn't looking to sell the company. We had just come from a turnaround and I was about to do a whole brand refresh, hired an agency to do that. And, you know, like, did a, an amazing partnership with Oatly that also funded and fueled kind of our marketing budget that was, you know, really eclipsed by the pandemic and, and was chopped in half. And so there were a lot of things there that, you know, a whole, whole nother interview just in and of itself, like how to save your company during a pandemic when you are bootstrapped, when you don't have the resources. Um, but in doing so, it certainly took notice um, and, uh, and and certainly, you know, was on the radar of, of my franchisee. And so when, you know, he looked at that as an opportunity to kind of like work with, uh, you know, individuals he's worked with in the past and his background was in finance. And so he understands kind of distressed assets and, you know, um, consumer brands from that lens. And he had the, an unfair advantage where he had, a, you know, this, uh, this famous YouTuber who was able to really connect with, again, that next gen consumer, that millennial and Gen Z consumer who, and, and I knew, cause he's like, Hey, I, I, one of my partners is going to be a YouTuber. He, um, did $150 million in merch sales, you know, in the last three years. And I was like, wow, like that's a competitive advantage. I can't do that. You know, I can't even pay to have that done. Right. I don't have that in my arsenal. And so in looking at what's best for the brand, I'm like, what's best for the brand. If I was truly about building the next gen brand, that's going to continue building on next gen and not end up being a legacy brand that 50 years later is like, oh, that used to be cool back in the day, but it isn't anymore. It needed something like that, right? And my franchisee, Neil, he himself was also that consumer base. Like when he bought it, he was 27 years old when he bought the entire company, right? And I was 27 years old when I first moved to New York and like was looking for my first location. And so to me, it, it almost came full circle where here we are, you know, I have a family, you know, I'm in my forties and, you know, I experienced a certain level of success, um, you know, in terms of building brand and what I really wanted to see for the future of 16 Handles and what was in the best interest of its stakeholders, which at that point were the franchisees and then the end consumer was again, kind of like new young perspective in terms of like what that next generation really wants. And so I would have been a hypocrite to say like, hey, you know, I'm gonna turn, turn no, like you're too young, you don't have the experience and then turn and try to sell to like, let's say a larger private equity group or someone like that. Like if I was selling that, that'd be the normal path. And that's how most franchisors end up, right? They get bought by either a much larger group um, or, you know, private equity financial institution. And that's typically how things are done. Uh, again, coming from a lens of I wasn't selling the company, you know, I was really looking at I, I just saved the company in my mind. Um, and we were going to double down in terms of like now repositioning ourselves from a position of strength to grow. Um, I'm, I think it was very serendipitous and kind of the happy ending where again, like, look who is now kind of taking that torch and running with it, you know, and has kind of the energy and the know-how of what that next generation consumer wants. The, the individual who literally during the pandemic opened up two locations, including one in Times Square, right? Like that's crazy. That was a dream of mine. So what I'll say is like, I'm so glad that Neil also fulfilled a dream of mine where when I first came to New York, my only two data points when I was walking the streets to try to figure out where my first location was gonna be was Wall Street and Times Square. That's really all I knew about New York City. I guess the third would have been Statue of Liberty, but I quickly found out you can't get there. So. Aside from there, I was like Wall Street and Times Square to me were the most notable kind of data points within New York City. And once I really learned about Times Square, I was like, wow, like, no, you don't go in there, you know, unless you're like a multinational brand. And even then, like, you don't go in there, try to necessarily turn a profit. It's really like an advertising and a branding expense. Um, so for him to be able to, you know, open a store there during the pandemic, again, it was that glass is half, half full lens, right? Where yeah, it's because guess what? In 2020 and 2021, Times Square was a dead zone, right? There were no tourists and it was, but in seeing kind of the long-term potential of what New York City is and what Times Square is, you know, in, in the middle of New York City, again, Neil saw that and jumped on it. So to me, there were a lot of similarities there and, 
you know, I, I think it was certainly now, it's now in the hands of, of, of somebody who cares, who's invested, you know, into the brand, not just financially, but, you know, put years of actually like operating the stores. And Neil also, the way he got into the 16 Handles franchise is I actually sold him my, my, my locations, um, including the original East Village location. And so there was already kind of this exchanging of this thing that I had built and turning it over to him, who was then able to find and unlock more opportunities, more efficiencies. Um, so again, it really takes that type of dedication uh, to, again, like improvement that I think um, really, you know, for me, it was an easy decision at that point that I'm like, hey, this isn't just somebody who's looking to make a quick buck. This is somebody who actually cares, is putting in the, you know, the hard work. And again, most importantly, understands that next gen consumer better than I do. And so I'm like, it's better off under his leadership and ownership at that point. And so, um, yeah, no, it, it wasn't, it wasn't this like elaborate strategy. And I think that's the key thing that I learned also, like over the course of my entrepreneurial journey was that the wisdom that's gained, you're able to talk about it and experience it after the fact, right? During the journey, during the process, you're in the process of doing it. So you can't speak to it through the lens of like, this is wisdom, like I've gained it. It's after the fact. And that could come from a huge mistake as well, by the way, right? Like, ooh, yes, when I lost it all, it was at this moment and these three steps I took. I will never do that again. You know, so in this case, again, like in looking back after, you know, the exit and the transaction, it became more and more clear to me that this was done not only just with the right of intentions, but it makes sense. Like this is the right exit. Yeah, I appreciate you taking us full circle now being at the Java Brands kind of catalyst and storing things. Um, and shout out to Neil, shout out Danny Duncan. You mentioned $150, $150 million in merch sales, an amazing uh, content creator in his own right, amazing branding he's been able to do over the course of his very young career. I believe he's younger than myself. Um, so yeah, shout out to those gentlemen. Um, unbelievable story for themselves and being able to reinvigorate the, the 16 Handles brand as you kind of uh, leaned into, I, I do. I, I want to ask one last 16 handles based question before we move to Java brands. It's very simple, very straightforward, and just 16 handles. W what is your favorite flavor or go to flavor? <laughs> yeah, so my favorite flavor when I've been asked this, um, my, my favorite flavor is the So Fresh Mango Sorbetto. It's made with uh, real mango puree from Alfonso mangoes that are uh, harvested in India. And I learned about what that was when I went on a missions trip um, through an organization to uh, go help uh, dedicate and open up orphanages throughout India. And I tried an Alfonso mango and I was like, what is this? This tastes like candy. Like, this is so delicious. And so I remember like we needed to create that flavor and my co-packer had access to that and created it. And so there's a special meaning, not only is it because I love the taste of that one, um, but it's also like, you know, that also came full circle where I discovered it literally like being in a, you know, halfway across the world. And then to be able to bring that and put them into the handles where others can experience that without having to go all the way to India. Um, and so that, that's a special one. And that's my favorite flavor. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I've, I've personally never had 16 handles. So when it, whenever I get into a market, I, I will have to certainly give that a go. Um, moving into Java brands. Um, you mentioned Greeno being very eco-friendly and similarly Java brands, the concepts you've worked with, as far as I can see, are very, um, I guess, uh, environmentally minded, I guess you say, or health minded, 100% um, natural ingredients on most of the alternative products that are being built and based around the Java brands portfolio. Um, how important is that to you to make sure those products kind of fall in that niche category is that something you follow through in your own day-to-day -day life or or is that kind of a, a line of thinking that you go into when you're looking to work with brands specifically yeah so I, I think where i've been able to work with and identify again those next gen brands and you keep hearing me say that like a broken record but that's to me again the longevity and the lifeline of a brand is are you at the highest level of relevancy and engagement with those who are gonna be able to buy from you, like your target consumer for like the next decade plus. And so when I look at that and I look at the food trends, right? So one of the things that I've also done over the years has been to attend a lot of these food summits, conventions, conferences, not just for food service and restaurants or for franchising, but again, in the CPG world. And the largest ones, you know, and the fastest growing ones in the categories have been in kind of this better for you, all natural, Again, I think because of what technology did in terms of access to information, that's where I saw the real kind of light bulb moment, even within 16 Handles, was when, look, we're now mobile first. 
right? And with that, even access to information. I mean, we have smart devices even in my own house. My, you know, my kids were like two, three years old. They were able to use Alexa or Google or Siri. And so this idea that you can't just fool me because I heard it somewhere. It's like, I can validate. I think, uh, you know, I saw that even with 16 handles when, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, um, what the ingredients are or, you know, the benefits of and and that's another reason why we were very careful. I never put out marketing out there saying how we're like healthy, right? Because that is, those are fighting words, you know, because if you, if you are like, first of all, like people's definition is convoluted with, with different terminology. And so to me, I didn't want to get that granular. I just wanted to own fun. Right. And so again, how do we approach flavors fun, you know, but we were mindful, right? We were mindful of what that next generation consumer wanted. So of course we did all natural ingredients. Of course we'd focus on, um, you know, launching like, you know, a plant-based uh, soft serve options. I mean, so these were the things where we leaned into kind of the dietary lifestyle and celebrations that our consumer base was, was showing us. And as I go to these food shows, I'd see it at scale. And so with some of those startups, as I started researching them and getting to know the founders, again, I'd be like, hey, like, where are you in your journey? And I was fortunate enough to be able to, to be involved, whether it's, you know, as, as an early investor or as an advisor to those brands. And so I think that's why the collection that's been collected over the last six years, since I really started honing in on, on startups, did that because those were the big growing categories. And I think they'll continue to be. Also, as I look at even the future with my own kids, right? They're the Gen Alpha kids. Uh, my kids are you know now in elementary school and just about to start elementary school. And so when I look at them, I, I think about what's the world that they want to live in and what are they gonna be the pillars of brands that they're gonna to wanna to support. And so even just as I go deep into learning, like what's really driving the purchasing behavior of, again, millennials, Gen Z, and Alpha, maybe a little too young to be able to get those data points now, that's what's always in the back of my mind is, are these brands, are these companies really addressing them? Um, like right now, it's all about Gen Z. That's the biggest you know, spending population. That's the biggest group. And so I think whether you're an old legacy brand or a new up and coming, like that's your base, like you're really starting with that. And so you're finding that, you know, whether it's green initiatives or whether it's addressing, you know, dietary, you know, uh, lifestyles, like those are the things that matter. Right. And I think it's also easier to now see and cut through where a brand is using it as a tactic, right. Versus this is actually what the brand is about and they really support. And I think that distinction is also becoming um, less and less kind of uh, uh, murky. And it's becoming very clear, like these brands that really stand for something are the ones that are gaining this loyalty and, and getting those, like getting that fan base. I mean, and, and being so forward thinking realistically about what you're planning on doing and what, and what brands you want to work with, you're thinking genera generationally, right? You're not thinking, you know, what, what's going to boom over, over just the next six months. You're thinking what's going to be interacted and accepted by generations and generations and generations to come. It's, it's so, it's just amazing to hear you speak about it in, in such length and so much detail. Um, I don't want to single out any brand, but I'm, I'm going to, and one that I found super intriguing was, um, this brand listed as sun scoop, um, founded by Carly Blum. Um, it's another ice cream product, which I found super intriguing. Um, it's organic coconut cream, no refined sugars. Uh, I just find it very interesting that you're helping develop uh, another ice cream brand. So I just wanted to ask in relation to that, you know, what's it like building another ice cream brand and how's it been working with, uh, with Carly and Sun Scoop? So, you know, I, I, I first met Carly, I think seven years ago uh, when this was just an idea and it was super rewarding being able to take, again, kind of a young, hungry entrepreneur and being able to, you know, offer guidance and offer support um, to be able to kind of materialize this idea. And, you know, like, I, I think even in the beginning, like, sure, you can argue like, well, isn't that a competitive product? You know, to me, again, this idea of one brand is not going to take care of the needs of, of every single person right? Regardless of how big it is. And I think that there are also going to be niches and subsets, um, especially the more um, specialized your product is. And so that was a, you know, I was involved in the early years, um, you know, it was really more of a passive investor, you know, for the last five, but um, you know, when I, when I, when I look at something like that, that's what really sparked this curiosity and desire to want to repeat the process because when I, when I had first uh, met her, like this was also, you know, I was already, 16 House was already, you know, um, an established, an established company at that point. And so to me, I was like, how do I, how do I get back to those moments of, 
you know, when nobody knows me, when it is an idea, you know, 2008 and I'm walking the streets and it's like, where do I open my first store? Nobody here knows what self-serve Froyo is going to even look like. And, and I'm going to be the one to introduce it to them. To me, like taking ideation and then, you know, in tech, you talk about an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. Well, in food service, you literally have to open up a restaurant. Like that, that's what it is. You know, and people will tell you by voting with their wallets, whether or not this is worth their time and, and, and effort. And if it doesn't, I mean, unless you have a long uh, runway of just cash that you're willing to burn, literally, um, restaurants, unlike other types of businesses, typically do not get more and more investment as they continue to lose money. And so when a restaurant closes, it's typically because it ran out of money, right? And so um, I think from that standpoint, I like the fact that it is, you know, that much of a pressure cooker where if it's working, it's working. When you see the lines out the door and it's booming, you know, it's booming and everyone knows it's booming. And when it's crickets and it shuts down, people, you know, typically get to the answer of why. And so um, I wanted to keep repeating that process and, and working with other startups. Um, I will say this though, this landscape right now is very, very brutal, right? And so now as I'm putting on my investor hat, um, some of these more speculative startups that don't have competitive advantages, that don't have you know, founders who, again, are able to outmaneuver all the other founders that are trying to do something similar. This is another, I think, testing point to me, very similar to the 2008, 2009 line, landscape when I first started where everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, this is not when you start businesses, like industries are getting crushed, right? It's literally called, you know, the great recession for a reason, right? <laughs> Historically, like that era will always be the great recession. And that's the origin story of 16 handles. So to me, lemonade, lemons, like, yeah, but that's also where innovation, right? Can, 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 can sort through and, and, and creep through the crevice of all that doubt and, 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 you know, um, and so, you know, right now is that type of a landscape. Money is still expensive. Right. There's a lot of uncertainty. It's an election year. We have multiple wars going around around the world. Like to me, like the, we're still feeling certainly in New York City, the after effects of what the pandemic did to the ecosystem of New York City. Restaurants in general are still struggling. Right. Not to say every restaurant is, but think about it. We're talking about a city that booms and thrives because you have, you know, somewhere six to eight million people coming in at once during the work week to be able to work, eat, spend their money thrive there, right, to that local economy. And right now you don't have that. You certainly don't have that every day. You might have that hybrid a couple of days a week, but again, like myself included, like I moved to the suburbs of Long Island. And so to me, like my share of dollar and share of entertainment is happening at a more local level. We saw that even with our stores, our suburban stores, like those, those same store sales went up and our Manhattan stores were getting crushed. Why? Because we, there's not as many people. So with that sentiment, again, I think the startup arena um, is is becoming tougher and those who are not able to outmaneuver their you know competitors and it's not going to just be oh well because we have an endless supply of money I mean sure but who like that's not typically the get out of jail free card that everybody gets most people don't have that card right um, and most people will need to figure out something else and, and and get creative and that's probably why I love doing that right because that was my journey like I had to do that I didn't have, I had a very finite window of, of success, which was literally one store. If East Village did not work, 16 handles dies right then and there. Right. And that, and that, and that's the reality. Sure. I knew that I could do franchising, but that's no one's buying a franchise unless it's profitable and it works and it's a proven system. So I still had to prove it. It's not like, because I came with knowing how to do franchise development and I had an idea that putting one and one together, like, you know, makes three, like it doesn't, it doesn't just happen that way. Um, and so I think in the same vein, you know, especially with CPG, the technology companies that I'm involved in, again, like if you don't have a, a, a big hefty war chest, then, and even if you do, you know, again, like that'll run out at some point. And so, um, yeah, like I, I expect to see a lot more innovation. And unfortunately, I also expect to see, you know, brands in my portfolio um, also dissolve, you know, like that's just the nature of how this works is, uh, you know, just because I invested doesn't mean that's the golden touch, right? Like, you know, it's, it's certainly, especially if I'm just an investor, if I'm not actually helping and doing anything to, to help grow that company, then, um, you know, then I even have less of, of an impact. But uh, that's also why I think right now in this season for 2024, I'm more focused through Java Brands on the consulting side. It's like pay me for my expertise and then force me to deliver on that. Because I think that's the best way that you're going to get the best version of me or the best version or the best, uh, you know, subset of skill sets that I've been able to acquire, um, as opposed to just as a general advisor, you know, can we put you on our cap table and I'll throw you some advisory shares? It's like, to me, knowing that it's going to be brutal, 
when I, my outlook on the next 12 months is it's going to be brutal. And I think a lot of these startups are going to, it's already been happening, but I think there'll only be more and more of these startups that are going to go under. Unfortunately, I don't want that to happen. I just know that it's going to happen. Um, and so for me, I need to be more mindful of kind of my time and also my bandwidth, which, you know, um, I think having a more hyper-focused approach in a consulting basis is going to be the best for all parties involved. Um, look, if I want to ultimately reach my goal of building this community and this accelerator model, I also need to have a, a winning streak, right? And so the best way to get that is just that value exchange of like time for money and let's go, right? Um, the future is a, a question mark, but you know, we can help determine whether or not that question mark is, you know, in the green or in the red and, you know, let's, let, let's attack that together. And I think uh, that's been the value exchange that's been working so far. I mean, Solomon, I, I feel like if we really wanted to, we could probably Joe Rogan this thing and, and kind of speak on this for three, four hours at length. I feel like if we wanted to get into the nitty gritty details, granular details about what you're speaking on further, we, we could, and we could probably go for hours. Um, I know we're, on our second day recording here. So I'm very appreciative of your time and, and we're on a time window here. So I don't want to take up more time of yours than I already have. Um, so I did just want to ask one last question here. Uh, we'll get you out of here. I want to give you some moments here to let the people know where they can find you, how they can contact you. If they'd like to talk to you about um, investing, advising, things of that nature, where can the people find you? Um, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I share in that sentiment. I mean, I'm so passionate about this for me. I I feel bad because people who've heard this before, I kind of feel like a broken record, but I say it not because it's easy to repeat, but because each time I say it, it invigorates me too, right? Because I get to relive kind of the glory days of, man, like all the hardship, all the adversity, but then ultimately having this happy ending of the entrepreneurial journey that I think so many of, you know, of us entrepreneurs want and desire. And so I never want that to stop. And, and that's why if you look at kind of like what I'm doing, what I'm building towards, it's so I can create a system that allows me to never end that process of helping continue to help build brands that people will love, you know, for a long time to come. Um, so, you know, that that's my desire. That's my goal. Um, clearly, I'm passionate about it. Hopefully, you know, the audience, anyone watching this will, will, will get a sense of that. But to connect with me, um, the best way is, uh, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, Solomon Choi. Uh, but my website, jababbrands.com, that's J-A-B-B-A, jababbrands.com. Um, there you can submit an inquiry. You can book a one-on-one -on -one call with me. Uh, I found another amazing platform called intro.co where I'm listed there. And you know you can buy 15 minutes of my time. Like I'm, I can't meet everyone for coffee or, 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 or something like that. But again, like to me, if it's worth it for you and you think that I can add value with something specific, I love a platform like that where it's like, I don't have time to give you time to just pick my brain because um, I need to work too. Like I need to help build, right? That's what I want to do. And so as much as I'd love to talk to everybody, I have to be intentional and thoughtful about how I'm approaching that as well. So again, I think that's a, that's another great value exchange platform um, that I'm a part of. Um, so you can find me there as well. But you know, to me, it's that. It's look, if it's a brand that you or someone you know is at the intersection of how people are going to continue to consume food and beverage, and or the technology that's going to help power that to bring it closer to open up more channels. That's the world that I'll be dedicated to, you know, being a servant in for the next 30, 40 years. And I'm going to continue doing that. Um, and so, you know, if there's a way that our paths can, can align, find me or I'll find you. Um, I'm also very active and present a lot of the summits and conventions and, and you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm available. You know, I think I also make myself accessible and visible at those places uh, to learn and to, to connect. And so, uh, that, that, that's where I'll be. And yeah, like you said, I could go on for hours, just continue talking about this stuff. Um, I, I love to, but at the same time, I need to get to work, you know, <laughs> like I need to help to help these brands that, uh, that, that actually need the help as well. And so, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. Hey, and, and you know what, Solomon, I, I'm going to let you get back to work. I'm going to let you go take care of these new brands you're looking forward to working with. Um, I, I will be at some conferences here down the road, so hopefully we can uh, get, a, get a little meet in person, have some conversations further down the line. But thank you so much again for your time. I, I'm very appreciative of you working with those issues through with me. Um, thank you for coming on a second day and recording this with me and, and making sure we got as much um a much as as much of your story and and details as possible. Um, I'm very excited to share this with the public. Um, th thank you again so much. Awesome, sounds good. Looking forward to it, Ben. Mm -hmm.